and we're back, we're live with, um, you know, keeping the world company. Uh, and we're going to talk today about the human flow, if you will. We're going to talk about people crossing from the southern to the northern parts of our hemispheres. Why? And whether there's a strange coincidence between the issues on the American southern border and, and the various borders in Europe. Um, why, why do they want to come north? Um, what do they find there? Um, what happens when they, they meet governments and people that are becoming increasingly isolationist and nationalistic? Uh, maybe that's linked with autocracy. Um, and in general, you know, what is the connection? And how much do we care about this? And one other thing is um, Ai Weiwei, an artist, Chinese artist and activist, made a movie in 2017 called Human Flow, and he talked about people who didn't make the trip very well and wound up in camps. And he revealed that there were 65 million people in 2017 in these camps with very little prospect of getting out of these camps. So where is this all going? Yeah, welcome to the show. Uh, Tim Apicella, co-host, uh, Jeff Portnoy, esteemed, distinguished guest, and uh, Stephanie Stahl Dalton, regular contributor. What a panel. Um, okay, so what do you think? We have this issue with the southern border, and we have this remarkable, if not, um, you know, precedent in Europe from Africa and um, a uh, Middle East and uh, Central Asia all coming north. And, and people resisting, increasingly so. Um, what's going on in the world? Tim, you first. Um, well, you know, if we look at the southern border and we look at um, those who are trying to apply for legal asylum and uh, the failure rate of whether someone qualifies or not qualifies for legal asylum is 90% or greater. So what does that tell you? It tells me that 90% of all those who are trying to get in to the United States are looking for a better life. Uh, be it poverty, be it uh, if they're farmers and they can't grow their crops anymore due to climate change issues. I don't know exactly what's going on, but it tells me that people are want to get out of their countries and uh, seek a better life. And that's what the United States has always been about, but uh, not so much anymore. Yeah, so what, Jeff? So they, they want a better life. That's nice. Why don't they uh, vote for a better leader in their own country? Why don't they try to fix things in their own country? Why don't they call upon other countries to help them fix their country instead of running away from it? Well, there's no question that the United States immigration policy is a mess. And there's lots of people you can blame. There doesn't appear to be any cogent policy as to how to deal with the crisis at the border, uh, either the president or Congress just don't seem to be able to get on the same page. Turning immigrants back and forcing them back to their home countries doesn't appear to be the answer. But the flow of thousands of immigrants into the country, many illegally, without any plan as to what to do, both for legal and illegal aliens, just seems to me to be a tremendous political problem. Why people come? Depends who you talk to, right? If you're pro-immigration, they come because, as Tim says, they want a better life. And they read back home or watch on television, assuming they have one. You know, this is the land of opportunity. They have corrupt governments. They, as Tim said, maybe are living in poverty. So they have this belief that there's a better life here. And there probably is for some. But there's no question, I believe from what I read and what I hear, that hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, are coming for more nefarious reasons. You know, they're either involved in drug trade because they've been bought out by the drug cartels. So it's difficult. And then, you know, some of it's racist, one way or the other, as you brought up European uh, immigration uh, to the United States has usually been non-problematic, except during World War II, where we became isolationists. So, and then, you know, you look at countries like France and France, France and Poland and countries like that, that have been inundated with immigrants now from the Ukraine, but before from Africa and the Middle East. 
Is their society better for that? That's up for debate. You know, I was on the Fourth Street Mall a few years ago when this first started happening, the migrants in Europe. I mean, it was something uh, that um, Tim and I in the old days uh, in the Trump Week show uh, covered a lot. It was about the migrants and how the migrants were affecting Europe. In any event, I, I caught this woman who was uh, Swedish. Uh, she was a student at HPU on the Fourth Street Mall. And I said, what do you think about the migrants? And she says, I am, I am um, disappointed with what my government in Sweden has done. And I appreciate um, more than ever before the Germans, because the Germans have been um, very sympathetic to the migrants. Um, this is before Ukraine, of course. Uh, very sympathetic to the migrants, and they have allowed the migrants a path, you know, to a better life in Germany, much more than Sweden. And so, what you know, what you have is, a, at least in some countries in Europe, a very sympathetic response, an arms open response. Angela Merkel was a perfect example of that. And more than the United States by far, she allowed millions of, of you know, uh, southern, southern, uh, global South people. Um, to come into Germany during that period. Um, so, uh, Stephanie, what, what is it with us? Are we not sympathetic? Do we not have the the moral um, the fiber uh, to do what Germany has been doing and other countries in Europe? Let me also add this. Give me your tired, huddled masses yearning to breathe free. For so many years, the United States was the beacon the beacon is at the top, the Statue of Liberty, isn't it? Um, and the, you know, the United States allowed people to come in for a better life. It was part of our national policy. We allowed millions of people to come in during those years. And now it's 180 different. What happened to us? Good question, Jay. I, I believe that uh, we've been um, off and on about that, that uh Statue of Liberty message. So um, that has, uh, you know, if you look at the graph of who gets in and how many they're allotted to allow in, there there are preferences stated, and and therefore, you know, they're pushing other people away. But I would like to also mention that Angela Merkel went down because of that immigration policy. So that that was problematic once um, the people came into the country, and that is exactly where we are. We have brought in enormous tides of people, and we're still working to to meet um, to to have the government uh, recognize and meet their needs in ways that are humane and that give everybody that chance for reaching their dream. However, I'd like to I'd like to draw on on Jay's earlier point about um, stay and take it take on the problems that are in your country since a lot of these people are coming from countries that are, are are making it more difficult because the countries won't allow even under under title 42 they wouldn't allow them to come back in so other than mexico these other countries venezuela and some of the other colombia they wouldn't allow us to deport them back to there they wouldn't accept them back so when they do um when when they do leave i think we need more look at why are they leaving okay we get the warfare and we get um corruption and we get we want to know what are those conditions and then we want to know what are the responses of these various people for them in other words we've got ukraine that's an incredible model an example they stayed and took on vladimir putin and the russian state so they stayed and took it on so I want to know more about, I think we all need to know there's more work that needs to be done to find out what are the forces at work in this mess that the U.S. has. It's not just us beefing up our policy and looking at that poem again on the Statue of Liberty and getting nice about it. We need to figure out what are, who are these people? What do they want? What do they need? What can we give them given our state of the economy and needs? And uh, then how can we help? So again, you know, I reach out to something like the United Nations or a bigger picture thing. How do we go in and work with these countries, those of us that can, those nations that are able to engage with these other countries to solve some of their economic and governmental problems? So, well, Tim, I, I, I want to ask you a hard question. You know, is this is this a kind of coincidence that when we looked at the migrant situation in Europe? And then we turn around and we find out that the U.S. has 
the same kind of isolationist thing. Maybe not at first, but after a while, people, the people on the street react to having migrants among them, taking, arguably taking their jobs, um, taking, you know, economic benefit. Um, and, you know, arguably, uh, as, as Jeff said, you know, um, undoing the security of our society. Um, they, they begin to, even though they're sympathetic at first, uh, they begin to react to that. And that becomes a, a political force, isolationism, jingoism, nationalism. OK, we have it in both places, it seems like. Um, and it started in Europe because of the southern borders. And it started in the U.S., or at least it got worse in the U.S. because of the southern border. Is that a coincidence or is that a worldwide you know, process, a phenomenon that, that, that occurs everywhere? Oh, I think it's definitely a worldwide crisis. And, you know, to address why people aren't going to stay in their own countries and fix things, I think many of those countries are ruled by fascist dictators. And we all know that in a fascist dictator society, um, people are thrown in jail or just simply disappear if they try to um, upset the apple cart, which is to say, try to put in a different political uh, flavor. Uh, how many candidates are, are locked up in jail all around the world because they dared try to run to be a different leader than the fascist dictator they were trying to replace? So I think that's a common element. And I think people get frustrated and they just say, I've lost all hope and I want to leave. But to uh, get back to your first point is, um, yeah, most nations are very open armed at first until what I believe is a false narrative. And that is, um, those who are immigrating are now getting free government benefits. And, and in fact, certainly that's a big one here in the United States. Oh, they're living off of welfare and they're getting all these benefits. They, you know, they don't want to do anything and they just want to, you know, live the life of, uh, you know, of luxury, uh, at our expense, the taxpayer's expense. But I think that's a false narrative. I don't think that happens very much at all. I think there's a lot of private organizations that are set up to help people, uh, immigrants in this country. And I think that's what's being handed out is on a private nonprofit basis. Um, but you know, these false narratives get into our, our bloodstream and it becomes a social wedge issue. And then those who are bent against uh, abuse of taxpayer dollars or, or good old fashioned racism, uh, they start to spark up. And they like candidates that uh, pontificate about nationalism and, and shutting off the borders. Um, Donald Trump comes to mind. Well, let me, you know, I may be on a different view than you guys on this one. Uh, I just don't, don't think you can have open borders. I, just I agree. Don't think, I don't think that's sustainable. And I think what's happening in the Southwest is, is a tragedy everywhere you look at it. I have friends in El Paso. It's easy for us in Hawaii to say, oh, everyone who wants to come across should be able to come across because this is the land of opportunity. Go down to these Texas border towns and see what's happening. And now, of course, they ship them off to other cities saying, oh, yeah, it's OK. You all want immigrants? Take them. I mean, you know, there's such a crisis. And yeah. frankly, I think there's two there's two types of immigration. There's white immigration. And then there's non-white immigration. You know, I mean, let's well, be Donald serious Trump's about it. Take anyone from the, uh, yeah. from the Nordic countries. Right. I mean, if Canada's border is opened up and people were coming in from Canada, I don't think the people in Maine would be having a very difficult time. So, you know, it, it's, you know, the irony is it's a political issue that no one has the will in politics to try to fix. They like to criticize one way or the other but you know what's going on down there is just is just awful and you know i, I don't agree that everybody in colombia whose you know farm has been damaged or because they have a government that's corrupt should be able to walk into the united states there is a legal pathway and people should be given that opportunity i mean you know but we have feel that there should be immigration reform jeff well, well, of course, but there way. won't be. There never has been. You know, Not in we, recent memory. One of our brethren in the bar from Hawaii, um, a, a Harvard graduate, went um, to Washington and got a job as counsel for the House Committee on Immigration. And he was there for decades and decades with only one mission, uh, to write a bill to reform immigration. 
it never got to first base. What a frustrating career. Yeah. They never wanted to do anything. But I am going to appoint you as the chair of that committee now. Okay. And I want to know what kind of reform you would do. It's a great question, and I can't even volunteer an answer. The comp it's such a complex issue, and there are a lot of people smarter than me that can try to, oh, there's one right there, who, who can try <laughs> to figure <laughs> Can I okay. say, I go ahead. I will, I will defer to Stephanie. Thank you, Jeff. Since I was a high school kid in South Texas and we snuck down to Laredo and all of these other places because we could get booze there and other stuff. And I mean, it, ever since that youthful experience, it has just been a complete frustration that you take one step over the bridge and here's all hell breaking loose and people storm to death the streets. Okay, so getting back to my other points, Yes, the Marxists and fascists and dictators and all these people are out there. They've been out there for generations and centuries. So the U.S. is an economic power, and we've got the power and the capacity to come up with another model, okay? So, like, why can't we go economically at this stuff? Like, get American companies to have branches down there. Get these people employed deal with these governments on an economic basis to make investments in the country that are going to employ people and give them a chance to build their country up into a decent economy. I mean, that's the mess everywhere. And, uh, and yes, yes, there's those governmental issues at the top. But if we get the people more empowered and educated through um are we now how much money are we paying to, to handle this immigration situation? Probably can't. It's trillions. So why don't we take those trillions, right, build the wall, block the borders, and start working with the other countries on their economic situation or whatever wedge we've got to go in there with. I mean, and if we can do it in a powerful way, obviously, I mean, the Catholic Church and we've got all of these non NGOs and all these nonprofits and all these people have been working their butts well, off. There's one other, one other phenomenon that's happened only in the last few days. Um, you know, in I think it's in Sudan or other places in sub-Saharan Africa, where the Chinese have built, you know, manufacturing facilities and and other, uh, you know, industrial facilities, and um, uh, they have been the target of, um, you know, of terrorism, the target of violence and all that. And and uh, there was an article recently about how the Chinese have changed their policy. They don't like to see their citizens killed in these unstable places. So they're changing their policy to defend themselves. So part of your you know, model here, Stephanie, is that American companies should go down, for example, um, to a, a countries in Latin America and try to bring some stability to them. Well, that necessarily involves dealing with violence. Well, and, not, and maybe well, that's what we have to do. What do you well, think, Tim? Well, yeah, thank you, Jay. Um, number one is we have a whole political force that both presidents use, uh, be it the GOP or Democrats, to say, we're creating jobs for Americans. We're encouraging and asking companies not to relocate offshore for uh, them to uh, you know, create jobs in other countries. That's a huge political um, shit, if you will, that uh, both, both sides of the parties are pontificating about. And, well, and guess what? Most Americans agree. Yeah, that American but, companies yeah. should be operating in the United States, creating jobs for Americans. Right. But have you seen what China's done in the South Pacific? They're into every island there that has any resources. They've got major... Well, they're drill, baby, drill. They're going to suck up every mineral they can for computer chip manufacturing. And once the, chip, the material is gone, the, the minerals are gone, guess what? They're out. Well, it's well no, not they're necessarily, also... Tim. They're there for influence. They're yeah, there for the structure. future. They're building, they're building, they're building their, their brand yes. all over the South yes. Pacific. And I, they even if they use up the resources, they're not going to leave so quickly. Why is it? So why, 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 why is it that this country has to take in all of the problems of the rest of the world? <laughs> I mean, like the Mario Boatlift? No, I mean, I mean you know, I mean, I, it's like you know, this. You know, Jeff, it's don't like you this... agree that the the, the 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 health of the world affects us, and if we don't attend to this, we're going to have more trouble. 
One of the reasons we have the problem at the southern border is we have not been attending to Latin America since the Monroe Doctrine. And Stephanie, you remember the Monroe Doctrine. Of course I do, Jay. We I, think she, almost right. saying, you know. I think she voted for it, as I recall. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, but anyway. There's trouble now. Look. But Jimmy, remember Jimmy? Little the, Jimmy? The, immigration, <laughs> the immigration problem, I mean, you know, it, it, it's been with us for a hundred and plus years. There was the Irish and the way they were discriminated against. There was the Italians. There was the Jews. But in general, was the, as a matter oh, of public but, policy, we but, love to see them coming. But, but they were white and they looked like us. We love to see them coming. So they it was hard to tell country. hard to tell who they were. These people mm -hmm. are not white. And yeah. nobody, well, you know, you you know there's just so much racism in the country. And that's really driving a lot of this. But on the other hand, you just can't have the chaos that there is. But, I mean, you know, but, there's but a lot of people. Them? There's a lot of people. Yeah. Go ahead. You know, they love to show on the news the mother and her five kids trying to come to America. Yes, I understand. How about others who we don't want? They're not going to contribute. They're coming because of social welfare and whatever. All I'm saying is it is an enormously complicated problem that no one wants to deal with. No, no we one, no to. one, no we one must, in government. We must deal with it. We, we must. We don't. We must deal okay, with well, it. Okay, well, let's, let's look at Europe for a minute. Um, why did England vote Brexit? Well, a primary reason was, and again, I go to Jeff's point about white versus non-white immigrants, is they refused to take on the EU's uh, quota of immigration. Yeah. They just said, no, we're not doing it. And why? Uh, again, I think Jeff's spot on. If they are white, they probably said, well, fine. But uh, they weren't. They were immigrants from Syria and sub, you know, in Africa. And they said, no, we don't want the quotas and we're not going to do it. Let's vote Brexit. The yeah, model, that's like that's shooting yourself in the anymore. foot. That's yeah, like shooting the, yourself in the foot. But many it, times we shoot ourselves in the foot when it comes to racism and nationalism and isolationism. Uh, yes, let's but take, should we, should we take, continue to do that? No, we should stop that. Just totally stop. No, Everybody I'm with Jeff. Stop I, I like legal immigration, people. not illegal immigration. I'm, I'm spot on with his comment about that. Oh, you fell right in the path, Tim. So how would you reform immigration? <laughs> Oh, uh, guess what? We had one on Trump administration. We had the Gang of Six. We had Lindsey Graham. We had um, John McCain. They had a deal. They had a deal on how to deal with, um, you know, a flood of immigration. And guess what? What's his face? Miller. Uh, I forget his first name. Whispered in the ear of Donald Trump, and Donald Trump backed out, even though he said he was going to support it and approve it when it hit his desk. He turned tail and and he vetoed it, and that was the end of real immigration reform that we had on the table. It was ready to go, and kaboom. It, it was blown into a million pay, uh, pieces thanks to, uh, come on, help me out, guys. What's Miller's first name? Stephen. Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Miller. Stephen uh, Miller. We had him, you guys. Stephen Miller came from a family that escaped Europe uh, in the war from the Holocaust. It's extraordinary and hypocritical to the nth degree that he would be the one trying to stop immigrants. Oh, no. Stephen Miller's being hypocritical. <laughs> That's the least of his problems. There's the headline. There's the headline for today's show. <laughs> Let's take Facebook. All right. Facebook made so much money. Don't know what to do with it. You can have something going on that's a Facebook thing in Mexico. Why isn't there a subsidiary or a chapter or a whatever down there of Facebook? you know, bringing people in to do some kind of work that they could do at the level of entry. Because I mean, they kill people there every day. Give them hundreds and hundreds of do people. What they do in the U.S. Well, yeah. but that's, that's only once a week. Wait, now wait, and, no, wait. Uh, wait, wait. That's only once a week. <laughs> that is all the it's time. A, it's in a fact, question of degree. Not the last year. Have, have put up warning signs about traveling to the U.S. It is too dangerous, according to them. Well, I, you know what? I mean, I think the irony here is, you know, unlike a few years ago, and I, again, I only know what I read and hear, 
These aren't Mexicans crossing the border. That's the irony. Yes, yeah, three, four years ago it was Mexico, Mexico, Mexico. Mexico is doing a great job keeping their people in Mexico. It's from right, the other right. Latin American countries who don't care. Oh, it's go, been everywhere. It's go, been everywhere, Jeff. It's go. from a Asia. It's from the Middle East. It's from Africa. We don't so wait. Wait. Away wait when's Mexico. the last time? When's the last time you saw a bunch of Asians lined up at the border? It, it's happening. It's happening. Where the people trying in to Seattle? Come in, the people trying to come in from the Mexican border uh, come from everywhere. They come to Mexico and then they make their way across. I'm not saying they're a majority, but a lot of people are not from Latin America anymore. Um, because the border is an open sieve. That's the easiest yeah, that's place. You're not going to get in through Blaine, Washington at the Canadian uh, Washington border. It's the southern border. It's an open, it's open of a sieve. So an you know, interesting comparison is in Europe, you know, they don't have a wall or anybody wants to have a wall. It's too complicated. Um, but they do have people coming up and then people in various northern countries reacting and going to the right, uh, you know, creating ultra right organizations. I mean, there are neo Nazis in various countries and it's all built around this might, as you mentioned, for Brexit, uh, built around this this migration thing. And, and I just wonder if no, it's not a coincidence. No. Uh, well, how you know, did the Italian prime uh, president, prime minister, how did she get elected? What was her platform? Guess what? Immigration reform or the lack thereof. Uh, Marie, we're enforcing, we're enforcing our sovereign rights yeah. to uh, not just let people come into our country without visas or authorization. It's, uh, it's a global phenomenon. And it's a copycat phenomenon, sort of like the guns and the violence. We discussed last time. No place in the world other than when Ukraine was sending its citizens were leaving to go to Poland. When's the last time you saw an immigration crisis at any other border other than the southern border of the United States? Let's Vietnam. start with that. Vietnam, Vietnam. what, in 1963? Five? Well, seven? Yeah. I'm talking about well, in the last 20 years, other than well, Ukraine. Well, that went on into the 70s, and the Africans are coming in, all kinds but of But wait, wait, places. they're not lining up outside the, the uh, you know, between France and England. <laughs> they're not, they're yeah. not, they're not, mm -hmm. you don't see the crisis. I understand they're coming to these countries, but somehow it is more organized in the way that these people are processed allowed in, not allowed in. So you're talking about two different things. You're talking about a policy in which you let immigrants in or not. And then you're talking about what's clearly a crisis, a humanitarian crisis at the southern border. It's different. Yes. And, and if Mexico's doing so well, then now that's a real good place to start working together. To, they don't want to them. Build their economy. We can make them want it. What what can we do? No, what China's doing no, in the no, South? That sounds Pacific. like Trump, doesn't China it? China is putting in millions and millions of dollars Poor into Stephanie. into those those islands. Hey, they're taking over. They're what complicates they're this? What complicates this? In the United States, <laughs> the land of AI and Silicon Valley, the land of the biggest tech companies ever imagined around humanity, we do not have the technology to answer a simple question. Who's here and who's not? We don't know. The Immigration Service has never been able to get a handle on who's here and tell you, you know, uh, what's going on. And that goes way back to the, the time. You remember this in the 80s uh, when there was a, 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 an enforced rule where the Immigration Service could raid your company and pull out your employees and send them away? Notice that hasn't been happening anymore. That's because we don't have data control on who's here, and we don't have the resources to deal with it. So I go back to the same question I asked at least a couple of you. And by the way, Stephanie, you've had some great ideas. You really have. But let me ask this question. What, what are we going to do? Okay, yes, it's a mess. I think that's you, you know, uh, unanimous. But what are we going to do? Let me ask you the same question again, Jeff. You've had some time to think it over. Maybe now you'll come up with more, you know, uh, a more cogent. Uh, 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 unlikely, <laughs> unlikely. <laughs> time is not time is not an advantage for me. No. 
I have no idea. All I can say is, and this isn't very profound, <laughs> what's going on can't continue. Right. And that's that's all I know. And how to solve it, what to do, you know, I <laughs> I don't have a clue. Okay, well, definitely with that, you know, frame of mind, you should definitely run for president. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I could probably do well in that regard. I mean, you know, look, I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of laughing about a really serious problem, but nobody seems to have the will to try to figure it out. It's, and I get back to how I started. It's politics. It's politics. It's so nothing more than politics. Saying that when we fix Congress, when we fix the Supreme Court, um, <clears throat> uh, then we'll be able to solve this problem? Well, we certainly have an advantage over where we are now, where we have an inability to agree on anything, let alone, a, a, you know, a, a problem as complex as immigration. Tim, you, well, had, you were shaking your head. I yeah, know. well, yeah. When we fix Congress and the Supreme Court, how about fix the, fixing the leaders of our country that are trying to polarize us in every avenue of social life and political life? How about fixing Donald Trump? Because he's the one that instigated the polarization of america well not instigate but he certainly put a lot of fuel to the fire on it and we can't get anything done now because um they're gop they're MAGA gop and we're democrats and nothing gets done okay stephanie you you had your hand yes. up too thank you um this morning on bloomberg kristen cinema was making a big pitch okay so she's got some ideas jeff she's and that's politics she's, she's never had an idea well, what she was suggesting stuff. This Bristol morning. Cinema has an idea. My yes, brother lives yes, in Arizona. Yes. Call him. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, she was pretty, pretty compelling this morning. So I'm sure they're going to be running that tape uh, all along. So and what's her idea? Pretty, well, her idea is to do the kind of things I'm talking about, but is to do things, be partisan about this. Number one. She's the big bipartisan. I guess that's her theme. But that's the bipartisan thing. Nothing's been done since 1900, whatever, but, but that's bipartisan about the border. And so she's calling on that. And, and of course, she's criticizing the administration, especially the vice president, for not getting down there and visiting, including the president. Nobody's do we, visiting. Wait. Come down do we have a so vice says, president? Wait, wait, do we have yeah. a vice president? Yeah, she's the one in charge yeah. of immigration. Well, yeah, is, isn't her fine. picture up in every post office that's yeah. being missing? Yeah. Well, okay. and also, so, so, can I take your remarks as your, <laughs> as your final statement? Uh, uh, or do you want to add something? Thing, one more remark. All right, one more remark is, remember, if you like peaches or if you like grapes, okay? We are totally dependent on the migrant workers, okay? So right there, we have got this commonality that needs a big bump. It needs a big push bump, and that's a way to start working on something because we can't let all so of we that. We address that spread. through temporary visas uh, for agricultural um, you know, harvesting. We address that as a country, as a nation, as a we government. We need to make it better. But we I need to make it better. I, I think Stephanie has Work come up. It. It always takes Stephanie to come up with the answer. Well, yes, it does. It, and I like I like peaches and grapes. I've changed my view in the last half hour. Let him in. Okay. Does anybody want to make a final comment? Raise your hand. I'll never get. All to right. It. Okay. Two out of three. <laughs> we'll give you a chance to. Um, okay, Tim. What? Well, like uh, independent cinema. Um, my platform is not unicorns and sprinkle of fairy dust. Uh, you need some real concrete ways of doing this rather than just throwing it out there in the airwaves. Bottom, bottom line is uh, it only works when the parties get together and, and, and hammer out a deal, which we had under the Trump administration. We could do it again, but um, you got to get out the antagonists. The, uh, it's almost like the NRA. The second you talk about gun, um, gun reform, uh, no one's listening. No one even goes to the table and tries to work on it. Immigration is getting to that point, if not already there. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, your point. I, I, and I don't. I, I really would appreciate it if you would not suggest re repealing the Monroe Doctrine. Okay. Well, Jimmy would be so disappointed in us, Jay. Come on. <laughs> but the thing is that um, we need to know how much we're spending on on migrants. We need a number. 
And I would like to see that number because I believe it's in trillions. It's probably one of the biggest factors on the chart of our economic spending that is a disaster and useless. So anyway, that's my point. We need to know that. That's a place to start. Let's talk money on this thing and then go from there. Well, that, let me, okay. well, let me, let me ask my twin. Let, hold on. Let me ask my twin. <laughs> I want to hear this. What do you think? He says we put them all on ships and ten, send them to China. Okay, and on that note, Cuba already <laughs> did that to the United States in 1980. Yeah. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. Well, I've, I've concluded uh, that uh, this is really, for the moment, it's insoluble. Um, it will take a, a bunch of really, uh, you know, uh, uh, motivated people in a room to figure out even step one. And you know, the problem is it's connected. It's connected to Europe and, for that matter, Asia. And um, if we don't do anything about it, there'll be more violence in the world, um, more of the things that people run away from, more people in highway ways, um, you know, human flow camps. I so, mean, the bottom line, the bottom line is it's a humanitarian crisis. Yes. And it needs to be addressed. Yes. People cannot be kept in camps. People cannot be living on the street for weeks while they're being processed. And the money in the facilities can't deal with what's happening. And so somehow there has to be some kind of organization. I don't mean a nonprofit, but some kind of effort to stop this mass of people from trying to come across the border. And that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be allowed in some way, somehow, but the way it's happening now, it just can't go on. Anybody want to top that? Hearing none, we're going to close the show. Oh, Thanks. no. Oh, come yes. on. Yes. You know, you know, you do have a dynamic to you, Jeff. You're, from your opening comments to your closing comments, it sounds like you've had a, a bit of a change of heart, and I'm gratified about that. Which uh, way did I change? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to change back, believe me. <laughs> Jeff Portnoy, Tim Apicella, Stephanie Stoltz-Dalton, thank you so much for this really, really interesting discussion. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.